Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Don L. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for the kind words, Pete. Glad I had you fooled. That's good. And I want to tell everybody how excited I am to be here at the Canyon Conference. This, uh, you may not know me, but I know a lot of you uh, in a roundabout way. You see, after uh, Jim and Vinoy uh, left the warm embrace of Oklahoma and headed to Southern California, they started another conference 15 years ago in Lake Arrowhead, California, called the Mountain High Conference. And 10 years ago, when I was two and a half years sober and scared and not having a lot of fun in AA and wasn't really sure if this thing was for me, I got dragged by a sponsor up to that very uh, same conference in Mountain High, and my life changed. And I started to have fun in sobriety, and I started to smile in sobriety, and I started to see people who work spiritual programs really enjoying themselves. And, uh, and I love Vinoy to death, I'll tell you. And it just, I've always heard about the Canyon Conference, you know. I've always heard that that's our granddaddy. That's where we came from. That's our inception. And I'm like, all right. So when I got asked to come out here, I was like, great, I get to see it. And you haven't let me down. You haven't failed to meet my expectations. I'll tell you what, my host, Ryan, has done an excellent job. He's been all over me like stink on <laughs> trash and uh, <laughs> done a wonderful job. And, uh, you know, we pull up here, and the first thing I see is 20 beautiful women lined up, waving and yelling, welcome. And I'm like, all oh, my dreams come true today. <laughs> I think I was 14 the first time I had that dream. I just it was like, this is great. I'm coming back every year. And I hope you love this conference if you're involved in it, because I know the love that I have for the conference in California that's very much like this one, that I so love, that's meant so much to my sobriety. And uh, I'm glad that, you know, I used to go there, and it took me a long time to get involved to the level that I'm in the last five or six years, and I'm having a good time with it. But enough of that stuff. I'm here to tell you in a general way my story, what I used to be like, what happened, and what I'm like today, and I'm going to do that for you. I was born and raised in Hollywood, California. (laughs) Hollywood's an amazing town. I'll tell you what, there's beautiful mansions cut right into the hillside cliffs, and they got live-in maids and big swimming pools cantilevered off and viewing over the city lights and Bentleys in the driveway, and it ain't the part of Hollywood we grew up in. <laughs> now, we grew up down in the ghetto, and uh, I guess my first resentment when I was about two years old, my dad got off the couch and said he was going out for a pack of smokes, and we never saw him again. And, uh, you know, I really have two childhood stories I could tell you tonight. You know, I got the childhood story that I dragged into Alcoholics Anonymous with me, and it's very tragic. If I tell it just right, somebody hopefully will feel sorry for me. Because that was always my intention when I told that story. And it's a story about the poverty. And it's a story about the dad deserting us. And it's a story about the gang-infested neighborhood and my mom's alcoholism and her bringing me home a new uncle every two months and, and all of that stuff. And you got to understand that when I, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I told you that story, I wasn't being delusional. I wasn't lying to you. That had become my reality. Because if you drink the way I drink and you act the way I act, it can't be your fault. And you have to wear the coat of that victim. you got to find somebody to blame it on. Because ultimately, if it's really my fault, I might have to do something about it. And I'm not quitting drinking. So I every drink that I took coming down the pike, it was never my fault. I always had some quiet way, something deep inside to rationalize and justify that. It's that dad that left. It's that home I came from. It's that alcoholic mom. I never had a fair chance. But a funny thing happens when you come to AA. And you get a sponsor, and they take you kicking and screaming through the steps. And what happened for me is I got to the steps four and five in the inventory process, and I did what the book talked about. I got down in black and white what really happened. And it's amazing the information that I conveniently discarded on my journey to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I found out that I had a mom that loved this. There were morals taught in that home. She used to get up early, get three kids off to school herself, take two buses to work and two buses home to put food on that table. Never took a dime of welfare. And I conveniently forgotten all that stuff along the way. And when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was filled with spite and rage and venom for that woman. And today we have a wonderful relationship, and I love her. And that hasn't been easy, but that's all a process of the steps. And more importantly, I had to stop being a victim in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous to finally start getting the gift of this program. Because ultimately, if it is their fault, you can't help me. 
and I will die from this disease. And I'll tell you, when I came here, I was looking for the chapter, the chapter entitled, What to Do When You Know It's Their Fault. <laughs> but it isn't in there. What we got is a program for the individual. And if I don't get anything else out of this deal but the fact that the only mistake I can really see that a loving God ever made for a guy like me is he made my eyes looking outward instead of inward. And Alcoholics Anonymous and the process of the steps and strong sponsorship has gotten my eyes off of them and back on me where the work needs to be done. And they're off the hook. You know, I have met the enemy and he lives in the mirror. And that's important information for a guy like me. And I'm so grateful for that. And I'm not a guy that picked up a fifth of Jack Daniels and went on a crime spree when I'm 12 years old. That's not my story. I tried. I tried to be good. I went to your schools, took your tests. Played your sports, dated the women you said I should date, and I excelled at all of it. And I did it with the guys doing the same stuff, and they're, they're fulfilled by it. Isn't this great, Donnie? Aren't we having a good time? Isn't this wonderful? And I'm mimicking it back. Yeah, this is swell. But inside here, I feel strangely hollow, like an itch I can't scratch. But I got nothing to compare it to. And I'm going along life, and I'm, I've got all, I don't know if I was born alcoholic. I don't know if I developed alcoholism. I have no desire to get into that debate. I'll leave that for people far brighter than I am. But I'll tell you this, I had some earmarks growing up. I had the self-obsession. I had the thinking about myself constantly. I had the I know how I look in 17 different angles at all times. <laughs> I, I know how to talk to you for a half an hour straight about myself and realize I'm doing that, and then stop and go, wait, enough about me. What do you think of me? I know. I don't have to come to AA to learn how to do a 10-step. I'm eight years old. I'm doing it every night in bed. Oh, I should have said that. What do they think about me? Where do I fit in? Pressure, pressure, pressure on the natch. Nobody doing it to me, just normal. I come to AA. I hear one of the big definitions of our insanity is we take the same actions. Expecting different results. Instantly, I realized the first time that happened in my life, long before I took the first drink, five years old, sitting in the sewing room, goofy little kid, bobby pin in my hand. Looked to my right, there was an electrical outlet. <laughs> Thought to myself, looks like it'll fit. Bam! And I got shot across the room, my hair is standing straight up, my fingers are smoking. And I remember thinking, did that just happen? <laughs> did that hurt as bad as I think it did? <laughs> and the important thing to realize is based on the way I lived my life till I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I guarantee you I would have went for three, but I was unconscious. <laughs> pain is no motivator. I don't learn from pain, and my pain has a short memory. And I'm uncomfortable. And I got nothing to compare it to until I'm 17 years old. When I'm 17 years old, I go out with the guys that play high school basketball with, and we're going to do some drinking that night. And I'm not drinking to get drunk. I'm drinking to fit in. And what was on tap that night was a beverage called Old English 800. And that's a, that's a fine malt beverage if there ever was one. And I went out with these guys I care a lot about that I played ball with. We went up to hillside it overlooks our concrete pond called the hollywood reservoir and we started drinking this malt liquor and i don't know when it happened i don't know how you drink malt liquor when you're 17 maybe it was the first can maybe it was the second can but i had a feeling come over me from my head to my toes filled me from the inside out and in that moment everything changed yet nothing changed i was standing with these guys that i really like these are my buddies i always like these guys but you know what now i love these guys <laughs> and i turned into a big old goober and i started telling them about it you know what i mean it's like, we're going to be together forever, man. <laughs> and I looked at the sun shimmering on that water and that concrete pond, and I got all choked up. I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I'm drunk for the first time in my life. And for the first time in my life, after I get drunk, my next favorite thing to do when I'm drunk is think. And uh, I had an idea. And I thought, i got to get down to that concrete pond. That looks beautiful down there. And the hillside was about 45 degrees, and I started walking down that hillside, very drunk. And I'm kind of walking fast down that hillside. And I'm kind of jogging down that hillside. And then my legs are kind of windmilling behind me down the hillside. And then I fell. And it was like, sky, earth, sky, earth, sky, earth, you know. And I slam up against a tree, and I know I'm hurt. Because I was moving. 
and the tree just stopped me. You know, when you hit a tree, the tree doesn't, the tree doesn't even go, excuse me, it just, whack. and I know I'm hurt. And I get up. Interesting. Important information for a budding alcoholic to have. When you drink, you can hit trees at high velocity. No pain. An alcoholic law of physics that would serve me well in the years to come. And I did all the stuff you do when you drink too much malt liquor at 17. I got violently ill. I got laughed at by my friends. I got thrown in the bushes in front of my house for my mom to find. Had my first big hangover the next day. Felt like dying. None of that deterred me. All I remembered was that moment on the hill. Where I, and I didn't have the vocabulary to tell you what was really happening. But I can tell you today, because for the first time in my life, I stood where I stood, doing what I was doing with the people I was doing it with. I didn't want to be anyone else. I didn't want to be anywhere else. I didn't want to be with anyone else. Absolutely self-contained. And for lack of a better experience, expression, I guess I had my first spiritual experience. I stepped out easy. The sharp edges became round. I felt good. I felt funny. I felt I fit in. I wasn't scared anymore. I wasn't self-obsessed. That invisible wall that's always been there between me and you, that feeling that you're just some kind of bit players in the movie of my life. I can't really connect with you. I can't care about you. Now I'm really interested in you. Alcohol frees me. It's not my problem. It's my solution. And I loved it from the first drink. I loved it from the first drunk. And the early years were fine. They were fun. It was a good time. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. It was free. I wasn't picking up a tab. I wasn't getting in any trouble. I wasn't standing in courtrooms in front of judges trying to explain my latest event of outrageous behavior. I didn't have my mom standing in front of me crying, going, don't you know you're killing yourself? I didn't have girlfriends hiding in closets because they're afraid they're going to get smacked around in my latest drunken rage. I guess we could take all those things and label them yet to be added to my story. And I was having such a very good time with the drink when I was 23 years old. And if God Almighty had walked into the bar I was drinking in and sat down next to me and said, Don, the next drink, the next one, it's going to pass you into a region where there's no return through human aid. You're going to have to go to Alcoholics Anonymous for the rest of your life or die a horrible alcoholic death. I told God Almighty, he got the wrong guy because it was working for me. Now, I'm not saying that this is my drinking wasn't a problem for other people at this point in my life. <laughs> You know, it may have been a problem for my landlord who's not getting his rent on time. It may be a problem for my employer who's only getting four days a week out of me if he's lucky. It may be a problem for my girlfriend who I can't stay faithful to. But you got to understand, it's not a problem for me until it's a problem for me. I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've had a girlfriend standing in front of me, crying her ass out, going, don't you know how I feel? And be like, not really. <laughs> always said the same thing. I'm drinking, you're watching, and one's more fun than the other. <laughs> and they started showing up in my life, and you've had them in your life, we've all had them in our life, the well-meaning people. You know, and the well-meaning people are family members and employers and friends and husbands and wives and district attorneys and arresting officers and doctors that stitch us up and we don't feel the needle and they think that's kind of weird and uh, they started talking to me about my drinking. Well, you think you might want to do something about it. You ever thought about stopping, slowing down? You haven't given any thought. They get defensive and they get angry and they said, no. Just thought they had the wrong guy. Another couple years down the road, I'm 25 years old and the light goes on. Every negative aspect of my life, every heartache, every failure, every plan I put into action and failed to hit the finish line right alongside with that is a drink of alcohol. And I got it. All this time they've been talking to me about my drinking and I think they're crazy. Now I got it. And at 25 years old, I had what the big book talks about for the very first time, excuse me, with no justification, no rationalization, no framing. What our book talks about is self-knowledge. Absolutely knew intellectually that the drink was killing me and I had to stop drinking. But I had a problem. I hadn't been to Alcoholics Anonymous and I hadn't read your book. And I hadn't got to the part that said, for the real alcoholic, he will absolutely be unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. And that's just crazy. You know why? Because I'm a man. And you know what a man does when he finds out he's got a problem with something? He just knocks it off. You just pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you just knock it off. And when I made the declaration, 
the first declaration, told everybody, I'm quitting drinking, so don't try to tempt me, I absolutely knew I would never drink again. And I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't get a sponsor. I didn't work your 12 steps. I didn't get commitments and meetings. I didn't get involved. And I quit drinking for two weeks. <laughs> and my program was all about, like, everybody how happy you are. You don't miss it. Should have done this years ago. This is great. You know, I'm working out more. It's really terrific getting to work on time. And the funny thing is that short two-week period, the outside stuff, the vacancy, it starts looking better. The laundry starts getting done, start showing up to work five days a week, start making the family obligations. And I'm getting all the affirmation from the people that love me the very most that you think a guy who just made a life-changing decision would want to receive. And they're saying things to me like, we're so glad you quit drinking. We thought you were going to die. We thought we were going to lose you. It's all going to be okay, Don. And I so want to believe that. And I'm nodding my head back to them. But right in here where my soul lives, with every day that goes by since my last drunk, I'm getting more irritable and restless and discontent and confused and baffled. Because for years you've been telling me that drinking's my problem. You know what? I agree with you. And I'm not drinking. So why do I want to kill myself or kill somebody else? And I had no idea of the real trouble I was in. I had no idea I had lost the power of choice where the drink was concerned. I still thought I was throwing the shot. Shot, 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 shot. After two short weeks of recovery on my own program, I had a perfect alcoholic thought. I thought I'd been good. And uh, <laughs> decided to reward myself with the very thing that had been tearing my life apart. And I didn't drink that night to tear up the car or go to jail or break somebody's heart. I drank to just get, I drank to take care of what they say in the doctor's opinion. To overcome an urge that I don't even know I have, that I don't even understand. A mental obsession too strong for me to even comprehend how much power it has in my life. Because I'm thinking it's just a half pint. And when I drank that half pint, the relief it produced within me was so precise, so concise, so where have you been all my life? Why did I think quitting drinking was a good idea? <laughs> that I made a mental note we're going to go about this thing called life without giving up the booze. Because then on some basic level, I knew down in my gut that not drinking was bad and drinking was good. And I'd have to figure out a way to pick up that tab. And my life starts shrinking. And I never drank again free from 25 to 31 when I made the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I did all the things you read about in Chapter 3, thinking I'm regaining control, feeling like I got some recovery going to find out I've lost even more control. And I pulled a geographic, and I moved to Boston, Massachusetts. You know what I found out? They drink in Boston. <laughs> I think they drink more. And, and I'm burning people out, and I don't want to live this way. And it's going on, and it's going on. And a typical day for me at the end starts looking like this. I wake up, and after that three count, where your head figures out where you're at, and I come to, my brain explodes. And it explodes to me with the facts of my life. I got drunk again last night. I don't know what kind of trouble I'm in. I'm hopelessly in debt. The job's always about to go. I don't know if I got a girlfriend anymore. And this is what I wake up to at 6 in the morning with a roaring physical hangover. But I got to get in the shower, and I got to go to work, because the job is always in jeopardy. And I'm thinking, tonight... Tonight, I'm not drinking. I can't go on this way, man. I'm dying. And I get in the shower, and I clean up, and I'm like, that's right. That's right. Just get through the day, Donnie. Get through the day. We're going to have some food. We're going to get some sleep because you're dying, kid. And that's a great plan on hangover morning. It makes perfect sense. And I go to work, and I keep my head down. I don't make eye contact with anybody. And about 10 o'clock, I'm feeling a little bit better. And by noon, I can even choke some food down, and I feel like I'm regaining my place in the human race. But I'm not drinking that night. And all through that period, man, one side of my head's going, yep, we're not drinking. And the other side's whispering about those facts of my life. Horribly in debt. You're a loser. You've taken everything that's come your way, Don, and you've just twisted it. You've used it. You've let your family down. Everybody's done with you. And I got this going on in my head. And every day at 3 o'clock, like clockwork, the miracle of 3 o'clock. Because after a day, all day, of thinking I'm not drinking that night. I have a little thought that pops in my head. I can just have a couple. And that one side of my brain with the plan about not drinking gets real excited. Hey, where's our plan? We're not drinking. We're getting some sleep, remember? Yeah, 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 that's right. But at 5 o'clock, I'm pulling in the liquor store parking lot. And I'm grabbing the jug. And I'm driving home with a jug next to me in the passenger seat. And I'm looking at it. And I hate it because I know what it does to me by this time. And I'm looking at it like the devil itself riding shotgun. And I'm talking to the bottle. I know why I do this. I know what you do to me. It happens every time. And my head's talking to me about the facts of my life, and it's loud, and it's making me crazy. 
And I get home and I get a glass and I fill it with ice and I put about four to six ounces of whiskey in that. And you take about half of that down, it'll pump the air right out of your lungs. You get some air back in there and you finish that four to six ounces and you repeat two or three times as recommended. And, <laughs> and I sit back on the couch and I wait. And I wait. And then it comes. And what comes for me is I know the beginning of a couple of hours that night of a feeling that vaguely resembles hope. Because what is hope? Up to that moment, I have nothing to prove that it's going to be any different tomorrow. I got nothing to say I'm ever going to turn my life around. I got nothing to say I'm going to make it okay with the f- of the debt I'm in. But for a couple hours a night, I can drink whiskey, and it all makes sense to me. For a couple hours a night, I can think about the very things that have been scaring me, worrying about, and it's completely changed. I'm worried about losing that job. Suddenly, I feel like this, ha, <laughs> let them fire me. Worried about the IRS catching up with me. Who needs them? Worried about the girl leaving me? Let her go. (laughs) That is relief. Doctors' opinions say guys like me drink essentially for the effect produced by alcohol. The effect for me isn't that I get dizzy and think I can sing. The effect is relief. It's relief from what swirls around in my head when I'm in a sober state and I don't know what to do. I lost the best job I ever had in my life in January of 91, and something happened in losing that job that probably had to happen for a guy like me to finally start looking at himself. And what happened is an employer called me in his office, sat me down, pointed his finger at me, said, you're done for your drinking. You're a drunk. You're never going to change. Get out. I'd been fired lots of times, but nobody had ever had the coconuts to call me what I was. They had always kind of cleaned it up. You know, they fired me for my attendance. They love to fire us for attendance, don't they? And I got the alcoholic indignation up. How dare you? After all I've done for you, you know. (laughs) Played the victim card and called up my sister in Simi Valley, California, and said, Pat, they've done me wrong, and i got nowhere to go. Can I come stay at your house and get on my feet? She said, you know what, Don? You can come stay at my house, but if you drink, you're out of my house, because everyone knows I'm a drunk. I told my sister, I won't drink. I promise, because I can lie to the Pope by this time. It's not a big deal. And I stayed in that house for eight months until I got sober, and I drank every day in that house. And if you don't know how you do that when they're watching you, well, maybe you're not a sneaky rat like I am. (laughs) I got no problem drinking around your schedule. I'm unemployed. (laughs) What time do you go to work? 7 a.m.? Bar's open. But you need to hear this. You know, at that point in my drinking, I'm doing oblivion drinking. I'm doing light switch drinking. I'm not drinking to make my make myself feel like my friends mean something more to me. I'm getting the whiskey on board hard enough and fast enough to shut off the head so I can get drunk, so I can go into a blackout in this room that I'm mooching off of my sister in Simi Valley, California, so I can come out of my latest blackout to meet the hideous four horsemen sitting on the end of that bed. Terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair. They sat on the end of that bed in that bedroom. I'm mooching off my sister, and they watched me and waited for me to come up. And when I came up, they started talking to me in my own voice about my own life, and they told me what a loser I was. And they asked me questions like, what are you going to do today, Don? Who are you going to rip off today, Don? Who are you going to steal from today, Don? What are you going to do today, Don? And I don't know what you do with a head like that, but I take another pull off the jug, and I swear I thought it was going to go down that way. I went up to my brother-in-law September of 91, and I got an unemployment check, and I asked to borrow his car. And he asked me an unusual question. He said, Don, will you be coming back? <laughs> <And> uh, <laughs> And the reason he asked me that, I kind of borrowed his car a few times that summer and gone out on vacations, we'll call them. And I'm an alcoholic. My outstanding characteristic is defiance, and I got defiant. Larry, how dare you? The last time this happened, I said I was sorry. I opened my heart to you. I really apologize. And now, you know, I'm having a tough time here, Larry. Larry felt bad and handed me the keys. And I remember thinking there better be gas in it, you know, because... And I went down to the liquor store to cash my check, because that's where alcoholics of my type cash are unemployment checks. <laughs> and while I'm waiting in line, I have what the big book describes as a thought that precedes the first drink. And for me, that always sounds like, what's in a half a pint? And I got the half a pint, we drank that, and the half pint got lonely, so we got another half pint. And I had the thought I could visit some friends in the valley and back in, be back in 45 minutes, and I'm gone. Three days later, I'm driving up the hill to face that family I'd done over one more time. One more time, I've taken their hope, their faith, and their trust, and I've torn it to shreds. And you need to hear this. Driving up the hill to face that family I'd done over one more time, I love them no less, and I love them at this very moment. And I love my family tremendously. But you see, I can't serve two masters. i only got time to serve one. And that's King Alcohol. 
and you get between me and a drink, it's nothing personal. It's almost business-like. I'm getting to the drink. I'm going around you. I'm going through you. I'm manipulating you. I'm telling you what you want to hear, but bet your bottom dollar I'm getting to the drink. But I don't know anything about alcoholism, and I don't know how to tell you that, so I say things like, I'm sorry. Don't mean to do this to you. I love you. Can you give me another chance? It got harder and harder for my family to give me them chances when I kept roaring through their life time and time again. I walk in and I find out my brother-in-law wanted to report the car stolen, and my sister negotiated him down to a missing persons report, and the police are on their way to do the follow-up work. Now, I got warrants for my arrest in two counties, so I start screaming at my sister, I got warrants, I'm going to jail, thanks a lot. I just stole their car, but now it's there. So I go outside to wait for the police because I don't want the interview to go on in front of the family because I have no idea what I'm going to be saying, but I'm fairly certain I'm going to be lying. And, uh, <laughs> and the black and white rolls up. And on the side of the black and white, it says canine unit. And I think, great, they brought the dog. Like, <laughs> like I'm in any shape to make a run for it, you know. And he, the cop gets out and he starts asking me those hard, tough questions like, where were you? And most of what I remember is illegal, so I'm lying. I'm making up a story about a bachelor party that got out of control. He starts looking at my eyes really hard, you know, and he starts leaning in, and I pick up that vibe, and I break his gaze, and he breaks with me, so now we're talking and dancing. And, <laughs> and my hands start getting wet, and I just want to divert his attention. I see the dog in the back seat. I go, hey, is that your partner? And he uh, goes, well, yes, it is. And he walks over, and he opens the door, and this dog gets out, German Shepherd, not a hair out of place. Like a Rin Tin Tin reincarnate, beautiful dog. And with no prompting on my part, he starts to relay facts to me about the dog's life. The dog is three years past mandatory retirement. They can't retire him. He's too good. The dog has participated in more arrests than any dog in the history of Ventura County. The dog has participated in more arrests and rescues than any dog in the history of Ventura or Los Angeles County. This dog was so phenomenal that the officers took a collection out of pocket to send him over to Europe for international competition where he kicked butt on German German Shepherds, right? I told the cop, that's an amazing dog you have there, sir. And I had one of those thoughts of find the back of your mind and stick like a dagger. The minute they stick, you know it's the truth. You may want to deny it with every fiber in your being, but you know it's the truth. And what the truth was is this dog had done significantly more with his life than I had done with mine. And I hated that dog. Because, you see, if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going to hear some amazing stories in AA from podiums like this. You're going to hear about people that were jet pilots and presidents of banks and made millions and only had alcohol, tear all That's not my story. You guys that drank and went to college, how do you do that? <laughs> see, alcohol was much more powerful than that for me. What alcohol enabled me to do was go nowhere, <laughs> do nothing, accomplish nothing, and be absolutely okay with that. Because the thing about my disease is it makes me think it's my idea. <laughs> Isn't that great? I'm killing myself, and it's all my idea. Uh, and I didn't know, but that was going to be my entrance in Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the lie to and seem spiritual, like I had some kind of moment, some white light, and the dog or something, dog backwards is God. or so. Not happening. Not true. <laughs> My family's done with me, right? They're going to throw me out. I'm a big guy. I'm a tough I don't Homeless? No. I'm not going to make it. So I played the recovery card. I mean, I played the recovery card like, give me the Oscar when I'm done, play the recovery card. I begged. I cried. Don't throw me away. I'll never make it. I'll go to AA and everything. You know? And so my family said, we'll see how it works out. I don't think they really believe me. My first two weeks in Alcoholics Anonymous, my family is taking me to AA. And they are picking me up from AA. You know how it makes you feel when you're 31 years old, 6'5", 250 pounds, and you get in your older sister's car at the end of the night, and this is what you hear. So, Donald, what did you learn in AA tonight? <laughs> and if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, you may be wondering, how long does this thing take, you know? How long does it take? Because I'm ready for that good life. You know, I'm ready. I'm so ready. And there's really two answers to that, you know. If you're sitting in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous, as you are this very evening, it's already working for you. 
because they're dying out there in the streets tonight. It took me a long time to realize that. From my first day in Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the most profound things happened. I stopped drinking whiskey on a daily basis. I mean, for 10 years, whiskey, 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 whiskey. Go to AA, no whiskey. Phenomenal. But I had a lot of other things distracting me, like the 80 grand I owe the IRS and the warrants for my arrest, and I hadn't worked in nine months, and the family's about to throw me out. All these big deals. All these big deals we come to AA with, and I certainly had them. I certainly had those big deals. And the most powerful thing happened to me at my very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got a sponsor. And you're wondering, how do you pick a sponsor with one day? Well, in my home group, I got sober, and they're smarter than the newcomer. <laughs> We don't tell newcomers, well, go pick someone that has what you want, because I wanted a Cadillac and some spare money, you know, that's what I wanted. They gave me my sponsor. I didn't even know what a sponsor was. They walked me over, this timid-looking guy, bald-headed guy, little John Lennon glasses, and they said, hey, Don, this is Mark. He's going to be your sponsor. And I'm kind of a street guy, so I sized him up. He's about five foot eight, about a buck forty. No problem. I have this guy wrapped around my finger in a week. Then we sit down. We had the first baby sponsor interview. He said, Don, I'm not going to ask you to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. It sounded very reasonable to me until I found out he went to 14 meetings a week. <laughs> Never said no to an AA request. And his idea of a good time is one of you is having a tough spot about 1.30 in the morning. You give him a call up, he'll go down to the local Denny's and help you talk through it. He used to say that the degree I'm willing to be inconvenienced for another alcoholic is the degree I walk with God. And I thought I have a spiritual zealot on my hands. And I was done when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was toast. My life was on fire all around me. I didn't know where to go. I just had some time to kill. I wasn't here to get sober anyway. Hadn't I proven to myself for six straight years a guy like me may put the drink down, but I always pick it up again. I knew it was going to happen this time, but I just wanted to buy some time, get the heat off, figure out my next move. I'll play your little dog and pony show. I'll play your silly reindeer games. I'll do whatever it takes. You know, I've got to put a couple of days together because I'm dying here. And this guy saved my life. It's not so much he took me through the steps, which he did. It's not so much he sat and read the book with me, which he did. It's not so much that he went to meetings with me, which he did. What this guy gave me was the most valuable thing anyone has ever given me in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the most valuable thing I can give the man behind me, and that's his time. He spent time with me. He explained things to me because my head told me that all these things I brought in Alcoholics Anonymous were big, insurmountable deals. And I talked to him about the debt, and I talked to him about court. I talked to him about the IRS, and he'd go, these are your problems, huh? And I'd go, yeah, I think they're fairly significant. And he told me I was wrong. And I hope I never forget what he said. He said, Don, you only have one problem. And that's that you suffer from the disease of alcoholism. And I'll keep it simple for you. That means you got something that wants to kill you slowly and take a large bite out of anyone that has the misfortune of caring about a loser like you. And we'll let you know when these other things are problems. Now, what I heard was I didn't have to pay back the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> and I made a beginning in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I got real busy. And 30 days in, he said, uh, we work around here. We're self-supporting through our own contributions. And I said, but I'm collecting unemployment. He goes, not anymore. <laughs> You're going to call them up and say you can go to work and you don't want any more of their money. I said, that was the craziest thing I had ever heard. Why would I turn away good money? And I gave him the whole speech. You know, I worked for a lot of years. I paid into that. It's really my right. Is there a reason you can tell me that you can't work? Damn it. I hate when they ask you that one, you know. And Other than being lazy, no. <laughs> so I get out my little Rolodex. I'm talking to my sponsor. I go, I got a lot of contacts left in the aerospace industry, which is the industry I used to work in before I drank my way out of it. And he goes, oh, no. Oh, no, you're not going back there. You'll make too much money, and then we won't see you anymore, and then you'll drink, and you'll die. No, we need something far more humbling than that for you, Don. So he asked me to give him my whole job history. I give him my whole job history. He goes, well, it doesn't sound like you've ever worked with your hands. I go, no, I haven't. I got two left thumbs. He goes, that's great. And he gets me a job as a laborer on a framing site. And I'd love to tell you some nice AA story about it. And I found out my life's calling was to work with wood. That's not the truth. I was so bad at this job. I had a nickname on the job site, The Bleeder. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it was like... So if you wanted me to be humbled, it was working. I make it to about four months of sobriety, and I'm busy, 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 busy. 
I don't, I, you know, I don't have any action, but I got a lot of activity. I'm not working the steps, but I'm reading the book, and I'm going to two meetings a night, and I'm working this job that I hate, and I hate the boss at that job. My sponsor couldn't be happier that I'm being humbled, my ego's being smashed. Whatever. <laughs> he comes up to me one day and he goes, "Hey, you got the day off tomorrow, right?" I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Great. Be outside at eight o'clock tomorrow. We're going to go to court," which was no big deal. We're, in AA, we're always going to court for somebody. We're standing up for somebody. We're vouching for somebody. We're waving goodbye to somebody. It's like <laughs> not a big deal. And I asked him, who are we going for? And he says, oh, we're going for you. And he goes, you want to live free, Don? you got to live free of this wreckage. we got to start cleaning up that stuff. You're a wanted man. And I thought, what have I done to him? I've done everything he's asked me to do, and now he's turning me in. I'm going to go to jail. I go, hey, man, I'm going to go to jail. He goes, maybe. <laughs> he goes, but by the close of business tomorrow, it'll all be over one way or another. And I have no idea what I did to piss him off, right? I don't sleep a wink that night because I know I'm going to jail. Not a wink. Morning, he honks the horn. I get in his truck, and my sponsor is in the best mood I've ever seen him in in my life. And I'm looking at him in shock. He's just all happy and whistling. He goes, you know, Don, I used to be in trouble. Now you're in trouble. This is better. <laughs> If you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous and you want to know why we're so happy to see you, because you're in trouble. <laughs> and this is better. <laughs> It'd be better for you, too. Hang around. And the beautiful thing about sponsor direction, having strong sponsorship in your life, even in that situation, I'm removed. I don't have to think of what to do. It takes me to court, tells me what to say. I get on the docket. Same thing happened in both courtrooms. I had to show up in two different counties. You know, they call your name, you stand up, you got your best, you know, Salvation Army suit on that you picked out the evening before. You stand in there and they rustle the paper and the judge goes, you're late. Four years. You know? and they asked for an explanation. And I just told the judge exactly what my sponsor said to say, which was the truth. I looked him dead in the eye, I squared my shoulders, I said, Your Honor, until four months ago I was drinking myself to death on a daily basis. I've been fortunate enough to become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I haven't had a drink in four months, and I'm just here to sponsor direction to clean up the wreckage of my past. And whatever the court deems necessary for that to occur, I will do so willingly. Because <laughs> you know, all night long, in my mind, I got a picture of a judge grabbing a gavel and going, we've been waiting for you, boy! <laughs> you know? And I mean, I didn't skate. I had to pay a lot of money back, and I had to do a ton of community service. I did so much community service at the Salvation Army that when I was done, they threw me a party. <laughs> <laughs> but the real message in there isn't that I started to get out of trouble. The message is I walked into a situation with a man I call sponsor, absolutely convinced that he was an idiot, and he had my worst intentions in mind. And I walked out a couple hours later of the same situation thinking, guy loves me, and he's not half dumb. And I took that piece of experience that really said nothing more than you don't have to live alone and you don't know everything, Donnie. And I put it in my pocket and I started to walk. And sponsored direction has changed my entire life. Every aspect of my life, every good thing in my life, what I do for a living, who I'm married to, what I do in my home group, who my friends are. My whole life is because I didn't listen to myself. All the good in my life is because I have been wrong about what I thought I knew in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had to unlearn so many things here that I couldn't have unlearned on my own without a sponsor helping me. And I'll tell you, I think I can explain why a sponsor works so good for a guy like me. He doesn't have the veil. Now, there's a veil that hangs in front of my face, and I know you can't see it, but bear with me. It's there. And this veil seems to be made of my wants, my fears, and my desires. My sponsor just doesn't have the veil about my life. Now, he may have the veil about his own life, and that's why he's got a sponsor. But he seems to have the ability to look at my life clearly and give me good direction. But you know what? If the steps don't work and you don't have a psychic change and a loving God isn't all that, then what's the point? But the truth is I have worked the steps and I have had that psychic change. And my thinking has changed greatly in Alcoholics Anonymous. I say about 90% of the time I'm right on the money. It's that 10% I don't know about. <laughs> and they taught me something in my first 30 days to save my bacon from them right till now. And that's, I don't make any major decisions without running it by my sponsor. And 90% of the time, I talk to him, and he goes, well done. Sounds like you thought it through. Sounds like everything's going to be cool. Go ahead, pull the trigger. I say, thanks, Robert. About 10% of the time, he goes, hey, uh, did you think of this on your own, or did you have help? And that has saved me time and time again.
And what my sponsor has really been trying to do with all these actions, taking all these commitments, working these steps, taking these inventories, saying yes when I didn't want to say yes, all he's really tried to do is keep me in the middle of the room in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what's so great about being in the middle of the room in Alcoholics Anonymous? You want to be a big shot in AA? That's like being voted most popular in your cell block. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> The reason it's so important for me to be in the middle of the room in Alcoholics Anonymous is I have bad days. I have days where my head returns and my thinking is so twisted I don't think I'm going to make it another day. But there's a lot of AA that i got to swim through to get out of this place. i got the guys I sponsor, the meeting I attend with commitments, the fact that when I say I'm going to do something, I know my sponsor expects me to do it. All these little things that you've taught me are between me and the door, and I like it that way. Because don't kid yourself, if you knew and you walk in this thing and you throw your hand up and you say you're an alcoholic, guess what? You're a member. But in the time I've been here, I've only seen two sets of actions. Now, there's a lot of stuff that goes on here, but it's basically cut it right in half. There's two sets of actions that people take once they get here. And they're so different, you can line them up on the other sides of the room because they don't resemble each other. And this side of actions that I've been taught, you never say no to an AA request. If you go to a meeting on a regular basis, have a commitment there. If you don't have a commitment, even if you go every week, you're a visitor. Gratitude is an action and only becomes your meeting if you're willing to do a little job. Always be willing to be a convenience for another alcoholic. Always say yes to AA requests. Have commit on and on and on. The list goes and it keeps you right in the middle of the room. Then there's this whole other side of AA that I haven't been brought up in and I don't understand. The steps are only suggested. Oh, you got to wear your sobriety like a loose garment. And all that crap seems to do is keep you right by the door. And the winds of life come up someday and you're gone. And it breaks our heart because it doesn't have to happen. And I'll tell you, if somebody comes up to you and tells you that stuff and goes, man, don't listen to that zealot who was up there talking. What does he know? So what if he's got a great life? He's 12 and a half years sober. He's never had it so good. So what if he's willing to look you in the eye and tell you, hey, he's the best damn thing that ever happened to him? So what? You know what? Don't die with him. Because this is you bet your life. And we had a bunch last night. And we're having a good time, aren't we? And I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love that laughter. But don't forget, there's deadly earnestness right underneath what we do. Because you're dying out on the streets tonight. And I'm just grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to be anywhere. I'm grateful for the good in my life. And the funny thing about Alcoholics Anonymous, if I told my story to a normie and explained it just right, they'd probably be attracted by some of the outside stuff. And they don't know a damn thing about Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm just impressed with the fact that I can get up today and do what I said I was going to do. That people don't cry in my house. That when I started making amends back to my mother and I started writing my mother those checks, she didn't call me up and thank me for the money. She called me up crying and said, when did you get a checking account? <laughs> and it's not all fun and games in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, life is life. It's a conveyor belt of life, you know. Just keeps coming around, brings the same stuff, changes colors, changes clothing. It's the same stuff. It's just a conveyor belt on a big circle. It's all good, bad, happy, sad, you know. My sponsor taught me, don't get stuck on anything too long. Don't get stuck on the bad stuff. Maybe you'll miss the good stuff coming on. Don't get stuck on the good stuff. Maybe you'll miss the bad stuff coming up right behind you. It'll kick you right in the butt. He goes, life changes. Don't have put your dependence on God, not people, places, and things. It's just a conveyor belt of life, Don. I never really knew what he was talking about. You know, I didn't really understand it, but I'll tell you what. I got really sick like three, four years ago. Got, you know, doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Finally get diagnosed. I have something called ulcerative colitis, right? It's a colon disease. Oh man, I wanted something with more dignity. But, uh, <laughs> and I, I was really sick. But you know, the funniest thing that occurred to me through this whole, it was like a year and a half process before I started feeling better is I went to meetings. I went to work. I didn't feel good, but it was an aspect of my life. Didn't dominate my life, didn't take the wind out of my sails, didn't feel good a lot of the time, but didn't worry about it. It was an aspect of my life. It was just something the conveyor belt brought me that I had, didn't have to get obsessed about. And that has everything to do with being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Not that I'm a good guy, it's just I was able to rely on you. I was able to lean on you. I was able to say I'm scared. You were able to pull me along, and that's what we do for each other. That's the family thing. And I've been able to go back into my family and make those amends and clean it up and be a good uncle and be a good son and be a good brother and try to clean that up to the best of my ability. And the amends process with my family was so amazing because if you would ask me before I did it, what did you do wrong, Don? I would have been able to talk about the money and the different things I did and stealing the cars. But thankfully, I had a sponsor that worked the amends and said, oh, don't always, always remember to ask them how they think you hurt them. And when I sat down and I would tell them how I thought I hurt them and I'd ask them if there's anything I could do to make it right, and I would ask, 
How did I hurt you? And they say, we don't care about the cars you stole, and we don't care about the money. The way you hurt us is when the phone rang at 1 in the morning, we knew you were dead. We knew you were dead, and we lived like that for years, never knowing when somebody we loved that much was going to die. I began to feel how bad my disease hurt everybody around me. And I started to own that. I had to take responsibility for that. And if I couldn't mumble and say, I'm sorry, I had to learn that an amends wasn't an apology. It's only an aspect of amends. And I had to start getting active in my family's life. And I got married when I was about four and a half years sober. And I used to go to this men's stag, and you married guys, you'd whine about your marriages. And, and I'd think I'd sit there on my throne of contempt, and I'd go, you know, why don't you try working a few steps there in your old marriage there, bud? And uh, maybe if you practice the traditions in your marriage, you wouldn't have these problems. <laughs> then I got married. <laughs> I'm running back to these same guys. How do you do it, you know? And, and that's a whole nother talk. But I love it. I love being married. I love being married. You know, it's just more conveyor belt. Good, bad, happy, sad. But it's not boring. It's so exciting. I like that. I'm having a good time. And I hope if you're new, you'll throw in with us. If there's nothing that I've said here tonight, because I can tell you all the little stories and all the things that happened, I'm going to tell you one story about what Alcoholics Anonymous did for me. And then I'm going to sit down, because I know we got a play to go to. Really interesting dynamic in my wife's family and my family is her father and her did not get along. They did not get along to the point of estrangement that they only communicated in letters. They did not get along years ago, and my wife had her own really severe illness. Through sponsor direction, she wrote her father, told him about it. Back, what do you expect after your kinky lifestyle? I don't like the guy. Then when we get engaged, we're going to get married. Sponsor direction, call him up. Ask him to give you away at the wedding. She does. He goes, no, don't think so. No, thank you. I really don't like the guy. Her sponsor gave her away at our wedding. You fast forward, we go down a couple more years. Eileen and I have been married a couple of years. We get a call out of the blue from her father. He wants to go on vacation in Wyoming for two weeks. <laughs> I turned into, you know, Ralph Cramden from the Honeymooners. Absolutely not! <laughs> Never going to happen! I call my sponsor up. He goes, you know what? You're going to be married a long time. You have lots of vacations. Give this one to her. Oh, and it was hell, two weeks with him in Wyoming, with him calling all the shots. And he's a terrible person. Bigoted man, angry man, just, just not a nice guy. And I don't like the guy. My wife's just thrilled he's back in her life. He's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> then he gets sick. He gets sick. He's got a little cancer going on. She's taking off work. She's driving an hour and a half, taking him to... Taking him to doctor's appointments, taking him back, taking him to doctor's appointments. And he's, you know, I'm going with, and I don't like the guy. And I'm talking to my sponsor about it. He goes, well, what do you, yeah, I go, I feel like a spiritual phony, you know. This guy's got cancer. My wife's really helping him out. He goes, well, what are your actions like? I go, I get in the car and I go with her. And I don't say anything. I keep my mouth closed and I'm being polite to the guy. He goes, well, you know what, Don, if that's the best you can do, that's the best you can do. And then, you know, we, we end up buying a house. We pay off all this debt, man. Pay back all this money, student loans, IRS, live in a one-bedroom apartment. Finally, buy a house. And i got to tell you, I'd never say this to anyone in Alcoholics Anonymous when it happened. But inside, deep down, where my ego lives and has, like, the sticks and stones keeping the fire going, <laughs> I said to myself, my reward for being a good AA member. <laughs> and 30 days after we bought that house, we get a call from the hospital, and Dad's taking a turn for the worse. And they want to put him in 24-hour care. And he's got six weeks to live. And my wife's crying. And I say, you know what, we're in AA. And we'll figure it out. Let's bring him home. If this had happened two months earlier, we would have had nowhere to bring him to. Well, we just got a house that I thought was all about me. And I found out that God had other plans. And we bring this guy home, and I don't like him. And now there's a hospital bed in my new house. <laughs> and I plan on painting that room. <laughs> and I call my sponsor up, and I'm telling him I feel like, feel like a spiritual phony. You know, I'm taking this guy in, and I don't feel it, Robert. I don't feel it. And he asked me how my actions were, and I told him my actions were clean. He said, just keep doing it, Don. So why is it got to be so hard, Robert? Why is it got to be so hard? He said, I don't know, Don. He goes, maybe you'll figure it out somewhere during the process. And we're trading off meetings. She's going to meetings. I stay home. I go to meetings. She stays home with him because he's got to be with him all the time. And the same thing would happen all the time. He'd be quiet. He'd be asleep. He'd be all morphined out the minute the door closed and she left. Don, oh, dude. Oh, oh. A couple of weeks before he died, I walk into the room after he bellows for me. 
And somehow he's pulled himself up to a sitting position on the bed, which is amazing because he could use skin and bones by this time. It was really shocking. And he's patting the end of the bed. He wants me to sit down next to him. And I go, oh, God. I start thinking about you guys. Alcoholics and I'm alcoholics. What do we do? What do we do in alcohol? Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Loving action. Sit down. I sit down, man. I'm like, I'm like cardboard. I'm just like sitting there. And he reaches over and he grabs my thigh in this like death grip. I didn't know he had that strength left. You just feel the fear coming through his fingertips. And I look at him and I can just see the fear on his face. He drops his head on my shoulder and now I'm really freaked out. Alcoholics Anonymous, what do I do? What do I do? Loving action. Put my arm around him. Hey, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Put the arm around him. Got my arm around him. I'm feeling bad. I don't care about this guy. I'm full of resentment. Don't like him. Think I hate him a little bit. He's breathing real erratic. I don't know what to do. And I'm thinking about, hey, what would you guys do? And I, just, I drop my hand down his back in a stroking motion. I go back up. I do it again. And his breathing just like immediately settles out. So he's breathing nice and even. He's on my shoulder. And he goes to sleep. And I'm rubbing his back. And I'm thinking about you guys. And it seemed like every time my hand went down his back, a little bit of resentment floated away. And a little bit of compassion came in. And then about 20 minutes later, when I laid him back and let him go to sleep, whatever was wrong between us was gone, and you have given me that. Because I understand, and I understand my resentments will kill me, but you see, I can't get rid of them alone. I have had so many examples of people that loved me when I was unlovable, that when I think of you and how I should act in my day-to-day living, you are the faces I see in my mind. On page 85 in the Bib book, it says, each day is a day we must carry a vision of God's will into all. I will be done. These are thoughts that must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along these lines all we wish. It's proper use of the will. When I bring that vision to my mind of how God wants me to live, your faces are always in that vision. I'm never alone. I'm always with an AA member in my mind because you have to watch and walk with me for me to live this life. I've been so fortunate to become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. If I get nothing more out of this deal than the fact that I get to sit with you and live my life with you and share with you, I am so overpaid because I thought I was going to die a wretched drunk in the gutter. And instead, I've been given a second chance at life, an undeserved chance, but I'll take it nonetheless. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.